Welcome to our gathering today at First Unitarian Universalist Church of Stockton. We continue in our virtual series of services. We're glad you have joined us and we hope you will find here what you are seeking. We are a community of individuals holding many different beliefs, coming from many different places, and each progressing on our own journeys of life and faith. We join together in our commitment to care for humanity and to shape a better, healthier, more hopeful world. We promise to accept and encourage all those persons of goodwill who gather here, recognizing that we all continue to learn and grow throughout our lifetimes. We we'll especially welcome and stand with LGBTQ persons, even as we seek to welcome all persons of every age, ability, status, and shade of skin. We strive to make our community a place of peace and acceptance, love and nurture, even as we challenge ourselves and others to live more faithfully according to the values of Unitarian Universalism. Our prelude today is by Bhakti Chan. Opening words from May 31st. Choose to bless the world by Rebecca Parker. The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, a moving forward into the world with the intention to do good. It is an act of recognition, a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. None of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility waiting. Chalice lighting for May 31st. We light our chalice today as a sign of hope and an act of commitment, acknowledging our responsibility to care for others as we work to build a better world. Our opening hymn is Building a New Way Number 1017 in Singing the Journey. We are one. 
invite you to virtually greet one another, knowing that we are not able to be together today and will not be able to be together for a long time. I encourage you to reach out to all those you know that are active in this congregation, as well as others you might like to invite. I invite you to join in our words, words of, of affirmation. affirmation. We, we believe in love. Love, love is, is the, the only doctrine, doctrine of this church. church. We, we believe in truth. truth. The, the quest for truth is our sacrament. We, we believe in helping others, and service is our prayer. We, we believe in the sacredness of life. To dwell together in peace, seek knowledge and freedom, serve humanity and fellowship, and cherish the earth and its creatures. This do we covenant each with the other. A Little Spot of Giving, a story about sharing and generosity, written and illustrated by Diane Alber. Hi, I'm A Little Spot of Giving. I'm here to show you how to give the most amazing gifts. We love gifts! These aren't just any ordinary gifts. These gifts have the power to spread kindness. Here are some of my favorites giving a gift of helping. If your neighbor has a hard time doing something, offer to do it for them. Giving a gift of teaching. Help someone learn something new. Just one more loop and you got it. Giving a gift of friendship. Say hi to someone you have not played with before. Thank you for asking me to play, this is fun. Giving a gift of advice. Offer help and guidance to someone who needs it. I think this painting might need a background. Giving a gift of listening. Pay attention when someone is talking. Giving a gift of compassion. If a friend is sick, make them a nice card to show them you care. Get well. Giving a gift of love. Make something from the heart and give it to someone special. I made this for you because I love you. Giving a gift of time. Spend quality time with someone you care about and focus on them. 
Giving a gift of empathy. When someone is sad, be a shoulder for them to cry on and an ear to listen. I lost my cat. I'm sure your cat is right around here. These signs will help. Giving a gift of hope. Offer positive words of encouragement when someone is feeling down. Giving a gift of teamwork. Working together can make you accomplish more and make tasks easier. Giving a gift of nature. Plant a new tree or garden. Giving a gift to the earth. Throw away your trash and help keep the planet clean. Giving a gift of appreciation. Say thank you to someone who helped you today. Giving a gift of volunteering. Find a charity or food drive to help others in need. Giving a gift of generosity. Be thankful for what you have and look for ways to go above and beyond to share. Giving a gift of sharing. If you have more than you need, offer to give some away to brighten someone's day. I was able to split my ice pop. Would you like half? Giving a gift of joy. If you have outgrown your toys, give them to children who don't have any. Now that you have seen the power of giving, what gift are you going to give today? At this time in our service, we share milestones in our lives by lighting candles of joy and concern. I have several requests for candles. One comes from Carrie Chesney. She says, that I'd like to share my joy that my daughter has successfully completed her Bachelor of Arts from St. Mary's College. She's graduated magna cum laude with honors from the English department where she pursued a creative writing emphasis. She also received a minor in anthropology and women and gender studies. She was thrilled to receive the activist award from the WAGS department given to one senior each year for her work leading a movement to have professors address students by their chosen names in classes, raising money for binders for students who want them but can't afford them, and leading the Pride Club for the last two years. Can't wait to attend a commencement ceremony for her, which will hopefully happen in December. So that's for Marissa's graduation. And uh, received word that uh, Roy has been waiting to schedule a knee replacement um, for quite a while now, and he's still waiting, but uh, he's hopefully going to schedule it soon. The carpenters are fine. The boys are in Groveland with Dave's son's family, and uh, Dave and Adele are keeping busy working on children's books and tending their beautiful garden. Rosemary sent in word that uh, catch up with these, that Wes Rule is recovering nicely from knee surgery, uh, which he had on the 19th, and he's doing his exercises and following through on physical therapy, and uh, he has only good things to say about his famous surgeon. Also got word that Gloria Smith lost her dear father, Alan Thode, on March 7th at age 94. He had lived in uh, O'Connor Woods. And uh, Rebecca Douglas got a special gift for her recent birthday, surprise visit by daughter Lisa from Marin. And uh, there were other factors of that, but she, that was the special part. Thelma Clancy celebrated her 100th birthday last year, and uh, she decades ago was the uh, director of religious education here. And let's see, Leslie Washington, oh, there's an adjustment to this, is resting after tripping on the edge of her front porch's unwelcoming mat. She has a bump on her head and muscle aches, but otherwise is doing fine. And she's more worried about exposure to COVID-19 because four well-meaning neighbors hovered over her to help without wearing masks. Um, Janet Minter, longtime First UU member, now lives at the Oaks Assisted Living Center in Stockton. Though her family can't visit, um, she uh, eats in her apartment, 
uh, but she enjoys group activities socially distanced, like bingo and singing old songs. I'll light one more for all those things that have gone unspoken as I invite us into a time of silent thought, prayer, and meditation. as we celebrate the birthdays that have been mentioned and think of the people whose lives helped build this congregation and strengthen it over the years. We remember the people, we bring them into our thoughts and send them good energy for all that's going on in their lives now. We keep in our thoughts also those who have had surgery and are in recovery, and those who are hoping to have surgery soon. We think of all those members of this congregation and friends who have pieces of their lives that are going on that we can't be a part of due to the quarantine status at the present time. We send our good energy to all of them, wish them Good celebrations, good recoveries, and a positive time without infection. We pray for the time that this congregation will be able to gather again, where we can hear each other's needs, where we can support each other in a more closer way, where we can be together to celebrate the kind of community that we like to share. So may it be. Amen. I invite you now to join in singing Spirit of Life. first by Mother Teresa. Love cannot remain by itself. It has no meaning. Love has to be put into action and that action is service. Whatever form we are, able or disabled, rich or poor, it is not how much we do but how much love we put in the doing. A lifelong sharing of love with others. This time in our service I invite you to share pledges, gifts, and offerings they all may be sent to our church office, 2737 Pacific Avenue, Stockton, California, 95204. Thank you.
social gospel, safety nets, and social democracy. The ideas that Senator Bernie Sanders brought to the fore in recent political campaigns were not really new, though they certainly have served to reinvigorate political discourse in the United States. Many followers of Jesus have always found such ideas in his teachings seeking to show respect and concern for others in supportive outreach through the centuries. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries in the United States, as the population was moving to ever more crowded cities, the social gospel movement applied Christian ethics to social problems. The term social gospel was first used by Charles Oliver Brown, but was soon being used by theologians from many mainline churches to, to describe their social outreach. Minister Washington Gladden was described as a pioneer um, of the social gospel, speaking up for workers and unions. Gladden wrote that Christian law covers every relation of life, including that of employers and employees. His book, The Christian Way, Whither It Leads and How to Go On, was a national call for the universal application of Christian values in everyday life. Early in the 20th century, leadership passed to the theologian Walter Rauschenbusch, American Baptist pastor of the Second German Baptist Church in Hell's Kitchen, New York. Rauschenbusch and other social gospel leaders formed the Brotherhood of the Kingdom to debate and implement the social gospel. In 1907, Rauschenbusch published his influential Christianity and the Social Crisis, in which he railed against the selfishness of capitalism and promoted a form of Christian socialism, supporting unions and cooperative economics. In 1917, Rauschenbusch published a theology for the social gospel, based in a series of lectures he had delivered at the Yale School of Religion as an attempt to further the conversation about institutionalized and institutional sinfulness. As the Wikipedia article on the social gospel elaborates, the kingdom of God, as understood by Jesus, is crucial to Rauschenbusch's proposed theology of the social gospel. He saw the kingdom of God as prophetic, future-focused, revolutionary, a social and political force that understands all creation to be sacred. The social gospel essentially was the progressive side of Christianity prior to the First World War, expressed in various mainstream churches, especially Presbyterian and black and white Methodist denominations. The social gospel movement inspired the settle house, settlement house movement which was expressed well by Jane, Jane Addams's work with Hull House in Chicago, and also the work of the YMCA's. New York, Chicago, Denver, and Seattle were especially influenced by the social gospel movement. Later, FDR's New Deal was also influenced by the social gospel, as was the civil rights movement under Martin Luther King, Jr. Labor movements throughout the first half of the 20th century 
were mostly supported by the social gospel movement, as were many domestic and international mission efforts. The Methodist Church in the suburbs of Chicago, in which I grew up and first became interested in ministry, was very deeply affected by the social gospel, supporting Whole House and various social outreach projects. There were also a few folks more interested in the Moody Institute and its emphasis on personal salvation, but I and many of my friends were influenced mostly by the social gospel long before I even learned about what it really was. I knew those teachings were in line with what Jesus taught, and that was good enough for me at the time. During the social unrest of the 1960s and the civil rights movement, the teachings of the social gospel provided an anchor, helping to make sense of a changing world. Though not entirely forgotten, the language of the social gospel was not often heard in the latter half of the 20th century or in the early days of the 21st. Democratic socialism is, however, very much in line with the understandings of the social gospel, which have always influenced my life and ministry. I first became more fully aware of the social gospel movement in college and seminary studies as I came to appreciate the work of Rauschenbusch and others who influenced churches and organizations that touched my life. I don't know why the social gospel did not continue to impact more religious communities, perhaps because of the aspersions cast up on any kind of socialism along with the anti-communist witch hunts of the 1950s. Even today, Bernie's democratic socialism is derided by Trump and many Republicans as being communist, which it is not. Too bad our form of capitalism never developed values closer to the teachings of Jesus, even if it is too often conflated with conservative evangelical Christianity. The idea of capitalism is not bad in and of itself, so long as it is mitigated by an appreciation of personhood that applies to all members of a society. Capitalism that seeks only to add to the wealth of those capitalists who already hold wealth and power at the expense of any others is ultimately self-destructive, but especially destructive of persons in the middle and lower classes by always seeking to wring greater productivity from workers. When anti-immigration sentiments are added to unfettered capitalism, there are no new workers to replace those worn out and used up by such a system. In our current situation, worker protections are being removed from industries even as health care is being eroded so that factories, industries, and farms will likely see their workforce further eroded. Since businesses of late seem only interested in the short-term bottom line, they will continue to amass wealth until the whole system collapses, though that may not take long without changes. Several of Jesus' parables dealt with workers and employers, often suggesting that even what is accepted as fair pay may not be as good as generosity that recognizes the personhood of workers. Squeezing workers to constantly do more for less income does not really mesh with the way Jesus described the kingdom, nor with Christian ethics. Conflating unfettered capitalism with the teachings behind Christianity reveals how deep the differences lie between the teachings of Jesus and the religion of Christianity. Bernie's view of the world is much closer to what Jesus taught than to what evangelical Christianity in the United States seems to want. The social gospel, even with its connections to socialism and democratic socialism, surely is a better choice for those who truly try to follow Jesus. Again and again, Jesus called for compassion, love being expressed toward others. Never did he call for blame toward those who had fallen short he merely asked that whoever is blameless cast the first stone. Too often today, the poor and middle classes are put into impossible situations over the lack of adequate health insurance and care. 
Too often the poor and middle classes are asked to pay more for food, transportation, housing, and any number of things than the deals available to the more affluent. Too often the poor lack the opportunities in education, job prospects, and all kinds of services which are ready, readily available to the wealthy and somewhat more available to the middle classes. Rarely do the poor succeed in pulling themselves up by their bootstraps when the wealthy are in charge. The social gospel sought to balance the opportunities of workers through supporting unions and offering compassion to those in need. This once was the kind of ideal associated with the values of our United States. Today, the chasm between the wealthy and poor is deeper than ever in history. The values of the social gospel would have continued and extended parts of the social safety net rather than vilifying the poor or anyone who takes welfare or any kind of handouts. Today, as unemployment reaches levels not seen since the Great Depression and more and more families lose health insurance, it is clearer than ever that our system really does not work, except perhaps for the wealthy. Even as we watch the COVID-19 infections head toward 2 million in the U.S. and deaths pass 100,000, as millions lose health insurance tied to jobs, we see too clearly the danger of being the last civilized nation to refuse to offer health care for all. As Congress gives away trillions to the wealthy and businesses, while sending just over $1,000 to most ordinary people, we see how poorly we are represented by the billionaires and millionaires in Congress in these desperate times. The social gospel offered hope to ordinary people in times like these. Its values were deeply rooted in the teachings of Jesus. In times like this, it is people who need help, not corporations. In times like this, we need scientific answers rather than platitudes or failed economics. In times like this, we need opportunities to support each other, carefully masked and socially distanced. We need the post office and we need the internet. We need health care for all. We need the best that our government can do and we need the best from our religious communities. We need love and we need justice. We need compassion and we need hope. We need the best of humanity. There have been other pandemics and other disasters. Most of us will survive COVID-19. We can choose to protect the young and the old, or we can choose to try to fix the economy using failed policies of the past. We can look to more democratic and egalitarian ways of doing things we can choose to see this crisis as an opportunity, a moment to choose differently, to move toward a person-centered way of being. For our church, the board has spoken, and we will wait until it is safer for older and younger persons, until we can all be together. Our target for reopening is now the first weekend in January, though that may be adjusted depending on how things work out in coming days. Until then, we will offer virtual services and meetings and try to stay connected. I pray that we may remain centered on the value of each person, that our religion will be practiced in our work for justice with compassion, that we do all we can to shape a better nation and a healthier world, while wearing masks and keeping a safe distance from others. When we do come together in person, we will know that we have done all we could to respect and protect all persons. Until then, we support each other in keeping hope alive. So may it always be, shalom, salam, blessed be, namaste, and amen. Join now in singing our closing hymn, Answering the Call of Love, formerly known as Standing on the Side of Love, number 1014 
in the Teal book. invite you now to virtually join hands. Know that this congregation is always and will always be dedicated to the proposition that behind all our differences, beneath all our diversity, there is a unity that makes us one and binds us forever together, in spite of time and death and the space between the stars. We pause in silent witness to that unity. And now may the stars carry your sadness away. May the flowers fill your heart with beauty. May hope forever wipe away your tears. And above all, may love make you strong. Amen. Go in peace. Stay well. <laughs>